we are in Treblinka. There was a Camp Treblinka 1 built here in the year of 4041, but it was the year of 1942 when the German Nazis decided to build in the vicinity of a major rail line connecting Warsaw with Białystok and then Vilnius. Somewhere in the density of the forest, somewhere in the vicinity of the former front line, they decided to build Treblinka too. Treblinka, because it was a genocide conducted in the heart of civilized Europe, it was a genocide conducted by one of the most technologically advanced countries in that time world, Nazi Germany, is definitely becoming an epicenter of human genocidal activity in 20th century. And I also think that it's becoming an epicenter of human genocidal eclipse in the entire length of history as such. Why is it so? So very early morning, July 23rd, 1942, there's a train load of over 7,000 of Warsaw Jews coming to the non-existent rail spore, which was located roughly behind my left shoulder. And this initiates the next 12 months only of the existence of Treblinka II death camp. This 12 months, even in the time span of World War II, is becoming the most murderous 12 months during the war and during the 20th century experience. Treblinka is already the third German Nazi extermination camp built within the so-called Action Reinhardt. So it's following the experiences gained in Bauschitz, in Sobibor, and then from July 42, Treblinka. But it's also following the experiences that were already worked out and gained in the fourth immediate death camp or death center called Helmno, in central Poland next to Łódź. But it's also following the earlier experiences that were collected in uh, the running and perfecting and the best possible practice in the place called Auschwitz-Birkenau, later on also Majdanek. So Treblinka is pretty much common in the very last phase of perfecting the technology of murder. And yes, only in this site within the next 12 months following the 23rd of July 1942 up until August, September 43. In early August of 1943, an act of utmost bravery happens in Treblinka. There's a couple of hundreds of Jews that are here are managing to organize a revolt. A couple of hundreds of them are trying to run. A couple of dozens of them are successfully escaping the territory. By November 43, the camp is non-existent. By November 43, there is not a single trace of anything remaining here of the camp physicality. So we are talking about roughly 12 months of a murderous operation in which an estimate is, is in between 800,000 to 900,000 of Polish Jews. Pretty much Treblinka became the site where the civilization of Polish Jewry, yes, this civilization that lasted on those territories for more than 900 years, was brought to an end within an operation of a couple of months. This is an aerial picture of the territory of the former German Nazi death camp Treblinka II, taken by the Allied plane in September of 1944, roughly a year after the German Nazis finished the mass extermination of close to 900,000 of mostly Polish Jews at the site. And in late of 1943, they decided to deface and erase any structure in an attempt of denying the existence of Treblinka. The death camp of Treblinka existed for a little bit over one year. And this picture has a map 
or drawing which is showing you the three prime sections of a comp like this. Here section number one is the administrative section which means that they used to be the administrative barracks of the Austrian and German SS officers or soldiers and barracks built for a couple of hundreds of auxiliary usually Ukrainian guards who were used in order to guard and perform all of the camp duties on the territory, particularly to inspect the inmates, the victims who were forced into conducting of certain technical parts of Treblinka functioning. So that's section number one, administrative. Section number two is the so-called reception area, arrival area. In the very bottom of this area you can see this red striped line which is showing you the place where the rail siding has been. A rail siding into which at any time 20 rail cattle wagons can be pulled in. From the reception area those on average about 2000s of Polish Jews were rushed into the two barracks that are standing more or less in the center of the picture. And then this red striped arrow path is showing you the path taken by close to 900,000 of mostly Polish Jews on their way towards the third section of a camp like this in the upper right corner of this picture marked with number three this was the death camp facility, which means a relatively small area in case of Treblinka with multiple mass graves dug with industrial excavators from the nearby gravel pit. And those two X's that you can see in the middle of this section, the smaller one in the center of death camp was the gas chamber number one existing from late July of 1942 into September of 1942. The bigger X is of a larger, much more efficient and scale-oriented gas chamber which is marked with this clearer visible X. From this point this section will become at first the burial place of by December 1942, over 700,000 of Polish Jews. By summer of 1943, when the camp is gradually discommissioned, close to 900,000 of Jews. In spring of 1943, and an attempt of covering up the camp and denying the fact of mass murder, the Zonda commando members, the young Jews who are forced to do it, are forced to exhume all of the mass ditches with corpses and they are forced to start burning the exhumed corpses in enormous open uh, pious and greets that are organized in this death camp territory. In summer of 1943, there are no more Polish Jews to be murdered in large numbers. Those who are still alive are only alive because they are economically vital and abused in the German Nazi slave labor system. So Treblinka can be discommissioned. Treblinka is erased from the territory. Every structure is removed. On this very picture taken in 44 in the bottom lower side you can see two barely visible structures. Those were village houses which were built in summer 43 when the original buildings of Treblinka were taken apart uh, and they were to imitate regular village houses to give the site an alibi that after it was blown over it was to look like a regular farm area somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So the German Nazis covered the area with denial and silence and this is how this area was followed by humanity later. Little if anything was known and little of anything was the interest of the world 
about the mass crimes committed here. Where does Dreblinka start? Does it really start on the 23rd of July 1942? Does it really start with the arrival of the first trainload of Jews from Warsaw ghetto, later on followed by well, over 300,000 of Jews from the Warsaw ghetto up until September 42? So maybe it starts with the technological preparation somewhere in 41, or maybe it starts with decision taken during the Wannsee conference. Maybe it starts with the German procedure of euthanasia, which is voted in and accepted in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. Or we can move back, maybe it starts with Hitler being democratically elected as the Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Or maybe we can move back in time. Maybe it starts with the 19th century progress in technology. Maybe it starts with Industrial Revolution and the new modern thinking and redesigning humanity, human beings, philosophy, ethics and morality. Oh, let's move back. Maybe we can move back into as early as 10th, 11th century when Christianity starts to use antisemitism kind of massively, mostly in the political, economic campaigning against the Jews. So maybe it's the centuries-old European antisemitism that is gradually, step-by-step, step, taking us into Treblinka. But let's not go that far. Let's stay within the last 200 years. I think that we shall start talking about the history of Treblinka in uh, later 1800s. Eugenics. There is a point in mid-1800s when in the world of botany, there comes a theory of eugenics. A very well scientifically proven theory in studying plants and flowers, developed by Francis Galton, Sir Francis Galton. A theory which was very well studied and grounded scientifically, but a theory which somewhere in late 1800s and early 1900s too easily and too loosely from the world of botany was transferred into the world of social sciences and policy. Why was it transferred so easily? Well, it was needed. Unfortunately, the world of politics and very often the world of social sciences is borrowing uh, certain concepts from sciences at the point when they are needed and they fit into describing the reality. Why was it so needed and fitting? Well, we are entering the age of colonialism. We are entering the age of exploitation. We are entering the age of apartheid in developing in South Africa. We are entering the age of racial segregation within the entire British Empire. So the theories which are talking about eugenic better formation of certain human beings is very handy at the time. So the science of eugenics is starting to grow and is becoming a political super tool being used by many global leaders of the, 20th, of the early 20th century. The eugenical conferences. Of course, at a certain point in the 20s and 30s in between World War I and II, it is Germany and then Nazi Germany taking the leading role in those scientific developments of eugenics. Of course, the German Nazis within the 30s uh, eager and prompted to take it yet into another level, into the level of complete uh, realization of ideological aims of the Third Reich. And such is the way how the genocide begins, and such is the very background of Treblinka. We are at Tiergarten 4 in Berlin. 
This address was the headquarters of the German Nazi state-run euthanasia project known as T4. Eugenics was developed as legitimate science and field of botany, but in the late 19th century it was appropriated by social sciences to be finally distorted and exploited for various political ideologies, leading towards colonial exploitation, racism and in the end laying foundations for genocide. The Third Reich as a state, already in the 30s, is taking the leading role in proposing and promoting the politics of eugenics. When Alex Kroll was taking this institution over in late of 1939, there is over 1,000 patients. It is estimated that sometimes monthly this hospital was receiving 50 new patients being registered. In 1942, this hospital has a little bit over 560 patients still alive. So there's a regular policy of trying to starve the patients, uh, depriving them of food, but also depriving them of proper medical treatment. Alex Kroll, after being briefed into the policies of euthanasia and the Third Reich, and after meeting with the, one of the leaders of Hitler Jugend, Axmann, is gradually working in order to diminish the number of patients in this institution. Already in September of 1941, the 91 Jewish patients that are being given treatment here are being transferred into a Jewish uh, psychiatric hospital in Zofiówka on the outskirts of Warsaw. This place will be very brutally liquidated. The patients will be murdered in summer of 1942. Sheer science and education make us more inventive, versatile, creative, but they don't guarantee the direction we will take those skills into. It is the awareness of morality and education of ethics which in line with science improves us as human beings. So in search of where does Treblinka start, we need to talk about language. Because everything in this planet starts with language. Everything in this planet starts with words. And this is exactly what also leads us into Treblinka. There's a certain language built in the 30s. A language which was not necessarily built on Leda. It was just revised, it was brought back from centuries of uh, moderate oblivion and occasional usage. A language of antisemitism, which all of a sudden started to be very successfully politically exploited by the Third Reich. The Jews were making a very easy target in the political propaganda and a need of constructing an enemy. Yes, the Jews politically and socially were always somewhere on the margin of social life and social thinking. Yes, the Jews were very often in European history being used as a scapegoat for all kinds of failure, for all kinds of political mischievements, for all kinds of economical issues. Such was also the need in the 30s in Germany, in Europe, but also in the world. So Nazi Germany and the Nazi German propaganda made the most 
out of the centuries of existing antisemitism. And once they've realized that it's working, that this language is actually bringing a short-term political gain, they've aided much more into that. Everything starts with words. Treblinka also started with words somewhere in the 20s and 30s of the German Nazis coming to power using the faults and weakness of the democratic system of that time period. Treblinka also starts with words. Words of hatred, words of exclusion, words building barriers and very often completely artificial borders so that the politicians can go into the very useful tool of divide and rule in controlling the society. This is also the beginning of tripling. One of the first things that a student of uh, comparative studies of genocides has to accommodate those days is the very basic fact that if there is a pre-planned genocide somewhere in this planet, once the first victim falls, it's too late. Because it means that the genocidal notion, the genocidal vicious circle is already at this level of advancement, that there is almost nothing we can do. So at the end of the day, those are the perpetrators, the human beings that are conducting a genocide. Yes, sometimes we are tempted to describe places like this as an eclipse of humanity. But who are the perpetrators? What makes a perpetrator? Let's look only at those that were commanding the scam, because uh, from the German, Nazi and Austrian staff, there were actually very few people conducting Treblinka. At one given day, when the camp is in full operation, there will be about 30, 35 German and Austrian SS soldiers and officers. But who were those 30 that were here? The first commandant, Infried Eberl, a doctor of medicine. He came here already in summer of 1942 when the camp was about to start. He's 32 years old. He's very much unprepared into the work that he is about to supervise here. Nobody would be. His ideological devotion in at first studying and observing the Warsaw Ghetto in spring of 1942 and then coming here to supervise the camp, his ideological devotion is making him completely crazed with demanding the next and next transports of five to seven thousands of Warsaw Jews being sent daily here in summer 42. At the same time period, he's completely mismanaging the camp and the camp does not have the capacity of either reception nor killing. Most likely, it does not have the capacity of uh, destruction of corpses. By late August of 1942, there's a major problem with a backlog of unburned or unburied corpses, which are all around the camp. The corpses were also buried too shallow and for the petrification process, they are pushed back to the ground. Yes, Treblinka in late summer of 1942 is looking like from the midst of hell. So Infried Eberl is fired. In the words of Dilo Globocnik, that is the general overseer of Action Einhardt, so the action which is controlling and commanding the free death camps of Belzhets, Sobibor and Treblinka, the headquarters of this operation and Lublin. In the words of uh, Odilo Globocnik uh, from late August after visiting Treblinka, he is saying that if it would not be for the fact that Infried Eberl is Austrian, like I am, I would put him in front of a military court for how he would mismanage Treblink. He's swiftly replaced. In September of 1942, he's replaced by Franz Strangl. Franz Strangl is described as a kind of a superhero of German Nazi extermination system. Franz Strangl is building the new gas chamber. Franz Strangl is putting the camp back on its toes. Franz Strangl is continuing with mass extermination of another Polish Jewish communities, actually very distant from here. Starting from late September 1942, uh, 
they are starting to bring here a couple of dozens of thousands of Jews from Trenstochova. Trenstochova is roughly about 600 kilometers, five, 600 kilometers from here. Yes, Treblinka from all of those immediate death camps operation would have the largest zone of operation, uh, murdering Polish Jewry. Franz Strangler is always wearing a white uniform. Franz Strangler is uh, heading for perfection in murder. And also very early recognizing the need for denial. When the camp was started, Franz Strang was 34 years old. And then comes Kurt Franz, his deputy. A man who was 28 years old in 1942. A man who was trained as a cook. Never started working. A man who has a dog called Barry. A Bernardine shepherd dog that he's raising in Treblinka. A dog which is used for chasing, biting and killing inmates. Kurt Franz is a murderer. All of those men, Strangle, Infried Eberl, Kurt Franz, they have the experience in the action euthanasia in Germany, in T4 action. Some of them were for a couple of years working in one of the six euthanasia centers in Germany or in Austria. So what they do actually in Treblinka beginning from summer 42 is conducting the same type of killing procedure but in a completely unknown scale. And for people like this, obviously, Treblinka was as natural as anything else. It was just a natural consequence of the language and the ideology in which he was growing up. Kurt Franz was also one of the first to be caught. Although he was released from prisons twice, in late 40s, both from American prisons being released because they didn't know who they have. Kurt Franz is finally put into prison in 1959. Only in 1959. The trial starts in 1962. Kurt Franz is sentenced to life imprisonment in 1965. When the prosecutors are running for his apartment, they are coming across a letter bond photo album with gilded letters saying in German those beautiful days. And in this album, that the photos, the only photos we have of Treblinka. Those photos are probably one of the most important physical evidence of Treblinka existing. It's also a fascinating topic how much sometimes the perpetrators contributed into protection and saving of some of the evidence. For the sheer sake of probably German need of documentation for themselves. Kurt Franz is put into prison in 1965. He's actually released from prison in 1993 because of his health condition. He's passing away late 90s, 98, if I remember correctly. Franz Strangl is another interesting impunity story after the war. He was put into American prison. He's also Austrian. Franz Strangl is also Austrian. He was put into an American prison. Uh, released. Because there's no evidence. There's no Treblinka. There's no physicality. And no survivors in late 40s. He's managing to run out of Europe using Vatican connection. He's actually first going to Syria. And then finally winding up in uh, Brazil. Finally, Franz Langl is extradited from Brazil only in the late 60s. He's put on trial in late 60s. If I remember correctly, in 68, uh, he's sentenced, 68 or 69, he's sentenced to life imprisonment. 
1971, he dies in a prison of a heart stroke. A man who personally, along with his deputy Kurt Franz, is very much responsible for the entire devastating phenomena which in history of humanity is called Treblinka. Infried Eberl, an Austrian doctor of medical science, he was the first commandant of Treblinka from June till September of 1942. After the war finished, he was put into a POW camp by the American authorities, but not recognized as an SS functionary. Released after the war finished, he married, he had a son, in late of 1947, he was interrogated again and arrested in January of 48. Uh, in a conversation with his fellow prisoner, he learned that his name is included into the special book on the SS Stadt functionaries, as a state functionaries, but only as an euthanasia program physician. On this news, he committed suicide by hanging in a prison cell in prison in the city of Ulm. There are no physical remnants of Treblinka death camp as in summer 43, after completion of the mass extermination, the German Nazis are meticulously denying every remaining element of when the camp has been. Today the site is uh, constructed with a monument unveiled in 1964, which is made out of granite stones and concrete. We are right now standing in the arrival area of the platform or something imitating the platform. There are stones which are mentioning the nationalities from which the European Jews were being deported into the death camp of Treblinka. And this cobblestone path is taking us from the reception arrival area into the death part of the camp itself. The central monument is made out of two pieces of granite carved and in 1960s it was supposed to be standing exactly at the site where the gas chambers were located. Today, due to the archaeological research, we know that this location is in a little bit different place. The area around the central piece of the monument is obviously, as we know from the mapping of Treblinka, the place where the mass ditches were dug out in order to at first bury, later on exhume and burn the mass corpses to rebury the ashes into the open pits. All of those open pits were identified in the 50s and 60s and the concept of the monument built in the 60s was to cover all of those mass ditches with human remnants with thick layer of concrete and to install within those concrete slabs around 17,000 of very uneven and irregular sticking out granite stone pieces. Today, over 200 of those stones are also having inscriptions with the names of Jewish communities, cities and towns all over Central Europe, mostly Poland, uh, from which the Jewish communities were deported into the death camp of Treblinka from July of 1942 into September of 1943. Yes, sometimes we are tempted to describe places like this as an eclipse of humanity. But actually, maybe it will be more informative and changing, breaking us out of this vicious circle of genocide if we start describing those places as an integral element of humanity. It's a part of humanity. It's a part of our heritage, whether we like it or not. It's as much a part of our heritage as the best paintings, as the best scientific achievements, as the best pieces of art existing. Yes, occasionally, under certain repetitive conditions, humanity succumbs into genocides. 